Well, I'm going to give you a little history and a little analysis. And you can always tell when a professor type's getting old. It's when the ratio of the anecdotal to the analytical gets distorted. Uh, so there's going to be some analysis and there's going to be there's going to be some anecdotal information here and there's going to be analysis and I promise you I'll try to keep the ratio 50-50. First of all, thanks to everybody that uh, has helped Severin with this um, uh, uh, symposium uh, financially and uh, in an organizational sort of way. This is an important effort, folks. Um, This is necessary if we're going to move agriculture from an extractive economy to a renewable economy. That's part of it. And uh, the inheritors of the land, uh, if the values that we're talking about here work, they're going to inherit a lot of the challenges that the current owners have. Uh, I want to go through just some of the challenges that are there for anyone that's associated uh, with farming. Farms have no depreciation schedule, even though the quality of the farm's soils may be in decline. Seasonal cycles and weather, plus weeds, insects, pathogens, will always confront the farmer. The farmer has no labor pool that's sitting around, ready at beck and call. Uh, only so many crops can be grown in a season. And when there is a temptation to double up on crops, farmers know it's risky. And, as we've seen, capital has a hard time uh, penetrating the farming part of the f to the farmer's advantage. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, to have from farming a fixed income, a pension, get paid even if injured or otherwise disabled. And while farmers can turn their uh, inputs into crops such as corn, wheat, soybeans, vegetables, animals, the various inputs, such as machinery, seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, have to come from somewhere. Lots of money is made by the suppliers, and the farmer has the risks. Farmers have little say when it comes time to sell their harvest and market it, and much of their harvest is going to need transportation. And processing is going to be necessary to make many of the products fit for the consumer. And farmers are not likely to control that end. So with all the kind of transformation that I think we're all hoping for, at least in this room, um, we are going to have those problems into the future, and other sectors of society are not confronted to the same extent that farmers are with these sort of problems. But what's telling is that in spite of all these obstacles, you know, many people want to farm, but it's only the passionate that'll stick to it. Those that do will be a special breed that we will call agrarians. Now, I want to tell you a story. Back in the early 80s, late 70s, I was on the board of Friends of the Earth. And the offices were over in San Francisco. And a professor from this university, Dan Luton, um, been trained in chemistry, but he taught in the geography department. He was on the board. Uh, 
Dan lived right across the street from David Brower. He was a good numbers smith, worked very hard to keep Dave straight on his numbers. And we were frustrated coming back across the Bay Bridge uh, because of what we thought was uh, undeniable, that we were getting no purchase on making climate change an issue. And there were other matters in the inventory of our distress as we uh, thought about that meeting. And Dan, driving, turned to me and said these memorable words. You know, Wes, here's the problem. We came as a poor people to a seemingly empty land that was rich in resources. And we built our institutions for that perception of reality. Our economic institutions, our educational institutions, our political institutions, and even to a certain extent, our religious institutions are all predicated on poor people in an empty land that's rich. And now we've become rich people in an increasingly poor land that's filling up. And those institutions don't hold. We patch them up, we give them a lick and a promise, <clears throat> but they don't hold. That stuck with me all these years. Ha, huh, 30, I guess. And I think that represents something that we tend to ignore about the momentum of the past and us on a new continent. And we're not going to have another one that's made available. There's another thing that I want to uh, talk about. Um, first of all, um, quick, what? Did you ask us? Oh, right there. Now that's going the wrong way. Well, okay. Uh, thanks. All right. Uh, I, I don't expect much of technology, and it's not to expect much of me. Um, here is here's our country. When are we ever going to be able to do that again? We came poor people to this land, and we managed to purchase Louisiana. We managed to, well, in our own way, after the Mexican War, managed to purchase uh, what's to the west part there, and then we struck a pretty good deal with the Brits on the northwest. Uh, but we all know the story. And, uh, now, Wendell Berry, in The Unsettling of America, he talked about how we came here and we found natives. But those natives soon became surplus people. And so we called them redskins. Surplus people in spite of the fact uh, that there were lots of diseases that wiped out much of the population. The, after the Civil War, the military had plenty around of, uh, of equipment, and so then they went off to make war against the remaining tribes. But they were surplus people, and there were still too many of them, so they put them on a reservation. That was the consequence of some measure of institutionalization. Well... What do you say then when starting, oh, 
back in the late 1800s, people start drifting off the land and into the cities. And then in the 1980s, 100 years later, we had the tremendous bath and lots of farmers left the land, and they're still leaving the land. We have something like two million farmers on the land now. There are more people in prisons than are on farms. Surplus people. The reservations this time <clears throat> are the cities and the suburbs. Poor people, empty land, rich, What's at work? A little on the analysis of that. Um, this is not being friendly to me. There you go. I sh show this slide almost everywhere I go. 10,000 years ago, humans got into the young pulverized coal of the soil and begin to spin that carbon at rates faster than its fixation. We laid waste to landscapes starting at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. So that was the first pool of energy rich carbon and then about 5,000 years ago we started using forests to smelt the ore for the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. That bronze and iron, along with the Industrial Revolution, sure gave us an edge over the natives. And then coal, about 1750 or so. And then Drake's oil well, 1859. And natural gas, well, we were using it uh, for lighting, but started using it for power after Drake's oil well in a big way. So we have those five pools of energy-rich carbon. And I have to tell you, I'm not getting much traction on this idea, but I think that there's some ghost-like qualities associated with uh, that highly dense carbon that is of a non-renewable source largely from the point of view of human time. There's something about that that has a way of dictating policy. We tend to believe policy leads and then our actions are derivatives. And it may be that we ought to turn that on its head. All right, now hold that um, on a back burner. Be mindful of what Dan Luton said coming across the Bay Bridge. 1862 um, was the Homestead Act. How was it that we got the Homestead Act that year? Well, when did the Civil War begin? year before. We couldn't have got a Homestead Act as long as the South was coming to vote. So as soon as they're no longer coming, the Southern states are no longer coming, we could pass the Homestead Act, which then allowed the expansion of the North. It's interesting that within three months, we put in what becomes the Land-Grant College Act, the Morrill Act, um, 1862, which established land-grant colleges on every state. In fact, for the South, uh, eventually, uh, there was a land-grant uh, for, um, for the blacks. So here we are then setting up our institutions. You, Berkeley was one, it later moved to Davis. Kansas State University, Iowa State, Purdue, Cornell. Cornell had a liberal arts, uh, but then they attached and made a land grant there in Ithaca. Um, 
Urbana, Illinois, Texas A&M, and so on. And that system, that knowledge base, then was followed with what's called the Hatch Act, which was the establishment of the experiment station. So you have the knowledge, you have the experiment station, and 1914, the Smith-Lever Act, we put in then the extension. So we've got education, we have research, we have extension, and we're on a new continent, and that system is predicated on the knowledge is adequate worldview, and it's predicated upon, to a large extent, that nature's to be subdued or ignored. And that goes back 10,000 years before with the beginning of agriculture, which had to do with the annual grains, which regard, required the tearing up of the ground so that you would get a soil in which the annual seeds could germinate. That's an idea that ricocheted through civilization and is still with us today. And what I'm hoping for the new breed of agrarians that they'll be ecological agrarians instead of agronomic agrarians. Because agronomy is a discipline for managing, uh, for, for, uh, managing disturbed systems in order to get a food supply. But now on the horizon we have the potential of ecology informing uh, a research agenda uh, for agriculture. Now you can hold that on the back burner, which is a part of this whole, uh, whole um, uh, story that Dan Luton is saying, the assumptions that we came with. Uh, well, this shows what happens when you have a lot of natural gas to make the most important invention of the 20th century possible. Uh, 1909, two Germans, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, learned how to turn atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into ammonia. And so, but you have World War I after 1909, then you have a depression, and then you have World War II, and finally, it's ready to take, take off. And so now, uh, half the energy cost at the field level on farms is for uh, um, uh, for, uh, for the uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, there's, uh, the pesticide industry took off at about the same time, around 1948. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring is 1962. Since then, the pesticide industry has doubled and doubled again. This is the consequence of some underlying presuppositions that go all the way back to colonial time and some presuppositions that go all the way back to the beginning of agriculture. And it really tears my heart out to think what these young people have got to confront. They've got to confront the history of us as agriculturists. And I think it's harder than they can imagine, and thank God for that. The highly dense carbon, the diesel fuel that runs our farms. I like to put this slide up. I show it almost everywhere, and I put it in uh, one of my last books. This is Norman Rockwell's uh, painting, 1948. It's called The County Agent. And it begins to pull together to a kind of a key moment. Uh, it's after the war, and so the boys are coming home, as the saying went. Many of them went back to the farm, but 
We've had a depression now. We've had this war. Now we can get going. And here is the county agent working with the 4-H kids and he's measuring the girth of a Guernsey heifer. The little girl has her notebook. You can bet the penmanship is good in that notebook. Uh, there were girls like that in the two-room country school I went with. They were such duty dogs. Um, <laughs> And then there's brother with the poultry uh, pr project. And then sis with the sewing project. And then everybody seems pleased with this. The dog's happy with it. Uh, the chickens are kind of paying attention. But dad's back in the corner with a cat on his shoulder. There's grandpa. There's the horse in the barn that probably the only horse, they'd probably sold the other one for dog food, and it may be just kept to plow the garden. Kept around to plow the garden with a five tooth. Well, that story represents really the end and the culmination because I happened to find out the name of that county agent. And I found out what town he was from. And I just called uh, anybody in the phone book in that town by the name of Ripley. And I got a real estate guy. Oh, yeah, that was my uncle. So I started asking, can you give me anything on the kids? He told me something about the kids. And I called up Gamma Sue. And Gamma Sue, who's the one with the notebook, I said, when did you... Are you on the farm or anything? No, we left the farm. I left when I was 18 out of high school. What about your sister? Well, she left too. The brother died in the 80s, right at the height of the crisis. Uh, the bull killed the father. Nobody's on the land. It's all rented out. Well, I can't tell you how many emails and letters I get from New York, San Francisco, the Bay Area, saying something like this. You know, I have this farm in Kansas or Iowa or Illinois, and the farmer on that land is using fertilizer and pesticides, and I would just like to have that farm uh, with Land Institute perennial grains or something like that. What can I do? I have nothing to tell them because they're caught within this structural immorality. And this is part of what Severin's trying to break through into. Because I can tell you, these people are earnest. They grew up on the farm. I'll say, well, what are you doing in L.A.? Oh, well, you know, I'm in L.A. And uh, Well, what are you doing in L.A.? Well, I mean, I got a job. Well, why aren't you back on the farm? Uh, well, because lots of reasons, and uh, I won't go into them. Some of them are legitimate, uh, probably all of them. <laughs> We've got a cultural problem here. Uh, and that cultural problem is rooted in a history. And we got to come to terms with that history and get to know that history as dense as, as it is. All right, now I'm, I'll have some senile rapture here if I'm not careful. Uh, all right, now I want you people to pay close attention here. Uh, because I'm about to give you some good stuff. I have to tell you hardly anybody pays any attention to this slide, but you're going to, because it, I think, represents the core of our modern problem. This is in the book by H.T. Odom called uh, Environment, Power, and Society. And that first slide is just showing a generalized 
situation where the little whiskers going off, that's where photosynthesis is taking place, the capture of sunlight by green plants. Those dark spots in the upper, that's where respiration occurs, where there is, um, where there is what we'll call concentration of the photosynthetic process. So that's just a general slide. Now come to the second one. That is a slide from Silver Springs, Florida. And those little dots up there are algae cells that are capturing sunlight. Those dark little things there are tube animals. They are the concentrators. Okay, so all you have to know is two words, photosynthesizers and concentrators. Got it? Photosynthesizers and concentrators. Now come to the next slide. That's looking down on a tropical rainforest in Puerto Rico. And there is the canopy that is the photosynthesizers. And there is the trunks and limbs that are the concentrators. Got it? Then, and that's by the way, I don't know how many feet, quite a few. Then this is looking down on Kansas. I'm imagining the 1930s. And there are the fields over, I don't know, two or three mile stretch that are the photosynthesizers. And there are the farmsteads and small villages that represent the concentrators. So you got the picture? You got the picture. Just in case you didn't, I'll make it bigger. insert highly dense carbon into that system called fossil fuel and suddenly you don't need people. You can change that relationship. Those radial lines can get longer to the concentrator. And this gets back to the ghost-like qualities of highly dense carbon entering your system. Now, where am I going with this? I don't know. But I can get part way. We've got to entertain the necessity to put a cap on carbon and lower that cap next year and the next year and begin to get by with a sufficiency of people rather than a sufficiency of capital that the ghost-like qualities of highly dense carbon make available. So people will get back on the land as the consequence of a necessity but will they get back on the land with the same underlying presuppositions that brought them to the continent, that brought them to this moment? This is 1950, a farm sale. Already, the tractor and the fertilizer are beginning to take their toll. That's when I was, that's high school for me. And the loft of the barn was the fuel tank. It's where they put the hay. The bottom part of the barn was devoted to the management of nitrogen. That's where they bedded down the animals, and that's where they had the straw that absorbed the manure and the urine that was then loaded up on manure spreader, pulled by a team, and taken back to the fields. 
So the cultural information of running agriculture more on contemporary sunlight, cultural information to run agriculture and culture on contemporary sunlight included an accoutrement like that barn. But the ghost-like qualities of highly dense carbon led to the destruction of that barn. Go throughout the Midwest and Great Plains. The only barns that are kept are there due to nostalgia and they're kept there usually by someone that's made enough money somewhere to keep them painted and restored. But something else comes in their place because they no longer need the fuel tank of the loft. All the energy of that more dispersed carbon in the hay, um, probably four or five barns, lofts, is represented in quantity in a fuel tank, a 50-gallon fuel tank on the, on the farm. So <laughs> we've got to begin to reimagine, uh, reimagine our place on this earth during this great transition. So the cultural capacity for farming went away when those young people left the farm and then the farm was rented out. The cultural capacity for running agriculture and culture on contemporary sunlight declined. I call it the great information implosion. I think there's a general law highly dense energy destroys information of the cultural and biological variety. The war against the rainforest and the war against cultural information. The rainforest is biological information stored in the DNA and elsewhere. And the cultural information on how to do, how to make a dress, how to look after a chicken, how to look after a Guernsey heifer, that is gone. So, what's this, what's this about? What's this, what are we up against? It seems as though the American experience has gone global. And I want to just get a little bit into the Green Revolution. Uh, and by the way, look at the latest issue of National Geographic. And the next seven issues are also going to be devoted to food. Oh, study that. Study that. Because we have something coming again. This time they're saying, oh, there's, a, there's essentially implying that there's a big tent. And we're all under that big tent. Well, but let's just be mindful about what happened in the Green Revolution, which is somewhat isomorphic with the experience that we had with our land-grant system here that helped contributed to driving the farmers off the land. Here's this, the assumption, my, uh, uh, my uh, direct, the Angus Wright, who uh, is my good friend and uh, chairman of my board, uh, he summarized this. Low production is the problem. We need higher yields per acre. Soil degradation was factored in, but as a cost in their emphasis on input-output ratios. The gap between the social reality and the scientific challenge was more or less ignored by the big players. There's a social reality, there's a scientific, there's a big gap, but it was ignored. By the way, Angus is going to be here tomorrow. Two, traditional techniques by countless farmers 
Asia, Africa, Latin America, were considered more of an obstacle than a resource. In other words, the people that had been running agriculture on contemporary sunlight, those were considered traditional cultures and therefore we are the teachers and they're the learners. Three, technologies are neutral. Well, now, how old do you have to be to <laughs> catch on to that? Atomic bombs and all that. Technologies are neutral. When persuasion fails, it's time to use compulsion. Four, agriculture is to serve as an instrument for the advancement of industry. The adoption of the Green Revolution package, fertilizer, um, pesticides, uh, uh, water wells, adoption of the Green River package is essential. You need more chemicals, build a chemical plant. And five, get this, agriculture is not vitally linked to wild nature. So the motivation for this big effort that's going to be featured for eight issues in National Geographic largely has to do with the need to save the wild biodiversity. Who can argue against that? The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report had said that agriculture is the major threat to wild biodiversity. So in order to save it, Let's intensify, where as one ecologist put it to me, intensify agriculture where it's already screwed up. So here we are. I mean, seven billion people headed to nine and without asking, then what? The erosion of the ecological capital we're losing, this is the United Nations now, this isn't the Land Institute, the United Nations says that we're losing 30 million acres a year due to land degradation. And it's been estimated that from 1700 to 2000, we lost in acreage about three times equal the current U.S. acreage of ag land due to degradation. And land use, largely because of the annual grains, particularly rice, land use is number two as a source of greenhouse gases behind power plants and ahead of all transportation. So there's more on the line here than we're talking about the stuff we're made of that's on the line. It's not mere nostalgia we're talking about, we're talking about practical necessities. So, how to act? How to act, knowing all of this? I read this book uh, by Marshall Gans entitled, How David Sometimes Wins. And it's the story of the David Goliath uh, encounter. Now, a little about Marshall Gans. Marshall Gans was an organizer for human rights uh, who wrote the book Why David Sometimes Rains. Now, Gans had started at Harvard. He dropped out and then embarked on a journey to help the oppressed, uh, first in Mississippi and eventually farm workers. 28 years later, after he left Harvard, he returned to Harvard to finish his bachelor's degree, and he continued on there for a PhD. <clears throat> so with nearly three decades of field experience, working with um, uh, various minorities, but now in the scholarly arena, he carefully analyzed um, the movement, successes, and failures. And so Why David Sometimes Wins is a write-up on what he learned, both as an activist 
and as a student of movement politics. So how could a shepherd boy like David defeat a seasoned giant warrior? I'll reface your memory on that famous confrontation. Nobody reads the Bible anymore. Uh, <clears throat> the big guy has been stepping out of the camp of the Philistines every day wearing a brass helmet, a coat of mail, brass on his legs. And the Bible says that the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. The spear's head, made of iron, weighed 15 pounds. And every day, Goliath, he cries out to the armies of Israel, Choose you a man for your side. If you, he is able to kill me, we will be your servants. But if I kill him, then shall ye be our servants. End of quote of Goliath. <clears throat> now, no one in the army of Israel would step forward. And David, the young son of Jesse, had been coming out to the battleground. He brought food for his brothers that were serving in the Israelite army. And hearing and seeing Goliath, he says to King Saul, I'll fight this Philistine. And Saul says, you can't do that. Now, this is a loose translation, but you can't do that. You're a kid, and he is a man of war from his youth. And David wasn't deterred, and he told Saul, uh, this is David now, the Lord that delivered me from the paw of the lion and uh, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Well, go for it, said Saul. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Saul, King Saul had a conventional mind about conventional warfare. He thought David needed proper attire. So he armed David with his armor, and he put a brass helmet on his head, <clears throat> and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David allowed all this and even girded Saul's sword up on himself. And by ordinary standards of war, he was fully dressed for battle. But apparently, while David was getting dressed, he was thinking, and he says to Saul, I can't do it, go this with these. And he took it all off, and he selected five smooth stones out of a brook and put them in his shepherd's bag. And now with sling in hand, with a bag of stones, he approached Goliath. Now this had to be a quiet moment for both armies. And when Goliath saw David, he disdained him for what he saw was a young, ruddy boy of a fair countenance. Words were exchanged, which you can read for yourselves. There's Gideon Bibles in hotels. <laughs> uh, so David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone, slung it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and he fell up on his face to the earth. All right, that's the story of David and Goliath. Now there's more to the story of what happens next. But here is what Marshall Gans said. David won. So let's imagine these young people wanting to get into farming. They're the Davids. And then here is the industrial agriculture Goliath. David won because he had courage. But he also won because... He did not think like Goliath. David had accepted his she the shield, the helmet, chain mail, and sword, but he took it all off because he had not mastered the equipment. Instead, he developed a plan based on what he knew and what he mastered. And Goliath underestimated him. But why is David, unlike everyone else on the battlefield, so strategically resourceful? He is more motivated. 
He is angry that no one will respond to Goliath's insults, but Gans, Marshall Gans, the author, advances a major consideration. Once David is called to act, he commits to the outcome before he knows how he'll achieve it. In other words, his commitment to act does not depend on his knowledge of a feasible strategy. Rather, he devises a feasible strategy based on his commitment to act. His decision to fight moves him to figure out how he can do so successfully. He makes the decision and figures it out. Now, the formal analysis for Gans begins, and you'll have to be somewhat patient because it's typical academic thought, uh, talk. So here's Marshall Gans, college dropout, organizer for 28 years, later conducting a formal study of movements which requires him to read and evaluate what other researchers had discovered, whether it's in civil rights or Cesar Chavez or whatever. First, motivation enhances creativity. We'll ho-hum on that. <laughs> Associated with creativity are concentration, enthusiasm, risk-taking, persistence, and learning. Gann says, when we are intensely interested in a problem, dissatisfied with the status quo, or experiencing a breach in our expectations, we think more critically and have a way to enhance our creativity, in part because they generate greater motiva motivation. Now, Gantz has several references for this, enough to put you to sleep, wondering why it takes extensive research to validate the, what seems intuitive. But if we think it's obvious and find it boring, why are we not acting on it? So the answer to the question boils down to the difference between extrinsic versus intrinsic rewards. How much money will I get paid? Or how much fame will I achieve? Those are extrinsic rewards. The research also shows, according to Gans, that the intrinsic rewards associated with doing work one loves to do, work one finds inherently meaningful, are far more motivating than extrinsic rewards. For successful so social movement leaders, their work is not a job but a vocation or a calling. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take a calling, a motivation. <laughs> their rewards are intrinsic and highly motivating motivational differences can account in no small part for differences, okay, here we go, for differences in resourcefulness among leadership teams. Gans gives an example. A key difference between the United Farm Workers leaders who succeeded and the leaders of the Teamsters and AFL-CIO who didn't had to do with the depth of each team's collective commitment to the enterprise. So it is intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. Now, perhaps you're wondering, when's Wes going to get to something I don't know? <laughs> well, be patient. Gans explains that there is more to the success recipe. David gathers the five smooth stones as something he knows how to use and use well. His skill, his competence, frees him to consider novel applications. He did not get that skill just by believing in good. He got that skill by practice. 
Can't you just see him as a kid out there day after day with Jesse's sheep, practicing with that sling and countless targets? I don't mean the sheep, but... And when Gans, what Gans found in the scholarly literature was, okay, creativity in a craft is linked to mastery of its tools. That is, to the craft person's relevant knowledge and skill. Mastery of its tools. Now, what does this have to do with you? Your extrinsic rewards will not be great, but if you employ your relevant knowledge and skill based on mastery of your tools, then the odds of your success will increase. Now be mindful, the title of the book is How David Sometimes Wins. It doesn't mean that just following the recipe you will win. Sometimes you'll win. So, now I love this part. David's skill with a sling and stones allows him to reimagine the battlefield. But he comes to this solution only after he's pondered the conventional use of the sword and shield and found he cannot use them. An outsider to battle... He saw resources others do not see and opportunities they did not grasp. Goliath was a military insider. He failed to recognize that a novel problem had even presented itself. He could not imagine that a shepherd boy could be a threat. Now I'm going to give you an example from um, our young team of scientists at the land. Our scientists look to the whole prairie ecosystem to inform their research, which is to look upward in the hierarchy of the sciences. Industrial agriculturists tend to look downward all the way to the molecule, be it the gene or an herbicide. Herbicide, well, uh, round up and round up ready, two molecules. Since we do not meet industrial agriculture on its terms, industrial agriculture, a modern-day Goliath, does not see our work as a threat. We don't get any flack. We just do. People are forever wondering, oh, is Monsanto challenging you? Monsanto's paying no attention to us. We've reconfigured the farm field just as David reconfigured the battlefield. So we're looking to nature as our standard or measure rather than nature being subdued or ignored. And so as a consequence, we've had some considerable successes that I won't go into. So Marshall Gans, organizer and scholar of movements, Learn the value of conceiving novel contexts and analogy. By making our analog the prairie, we can imagine farming like the prairie. Change agents require creativity, which is linked to mastery of their tools. And an additional reminder before I move on. I already said it, but David was called to act and committed to the outcome before he knew how he'd achieve it. Severing has done this. Now is, uh, yeah. Is, da is David defeats Goliath an appropriate analogy for our time? It does carry... Uh, some useful insight for us here. I believe, however, that except for the subtle lessons the story offered, we dropped the metaphor of the single person, single pedal, and the sling. It has served as prototype for the silver bullet approach where the Lone Ranger is David, his pistol David's sling, the silver bullet, the rounded pebble. There will be no silver bullet, but there are other things that can be derived 
other ideas that can be derived. So, what's on the line? We've not yet discovered America. We've only colonized it. And the deep discovery of America, of where we are and where our food really comes from, still lies before us. Beyond our country, the discovery of our ecosphere lies before us. And it won't be easy. We need to work on our vocabulary. We need to quit using the term biosphere, which has the bio bias and then causes us to play fast and loose with the physical part that keeps us sustained. I think we need to be very careful and see if there's a way that we can get over using the word environment, which implies an out there and something that we do for, uh, like a homeless person or something. We're embedded within an ecosphere, and agriculture is embedded within the ecosystem concept. So <clears throat> my friend Chuck Washburn, a late friend, he's dead now, uh, said to me once, if we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. Agriculture ultimately has ecology and evolutionary biology standing behind it. The materials sector, the industrial sector has no discipline standing behind it. And so, I'm going to recommend, I won't go through it, but I'm going to recommend that you read Danella Meadows' paper. Um, uh, you'll probably find it on the internet, but it has to do, she's one of the authors of The Limits to Growth. Um, it has to do with ways to interfere with, inter, in, intervene within a system. And she lists 12 of them. And, um, uh, the one that is the most powerful of all, number one, she lists them in declining order from 12 to 1. I'll give you number 12 and I'll then give you number 1. The least effective way is such constants as subsidies and taxes. And the most effective way is in the power to transcend paradigms. The transcending of the paradigms is the most effective way to interfere within a system. So, I don't have a good way to end. Uh, but I do end sort of with a plea. We've got to start featuring questions that go beyond the available answers. I think we've got to quit meeting people where they are. And spend more time in discussion with the choir. And Acknowledge that we're fundamentally ignorant and adopt an ignorance-based worldview rather than a knowledge-is-adequate worldview. That's the source of humility that's going to be necessary to pull through on this. Living with certainty is an awful burden. Uh, and it leads to fundamentalism and fundamentalism has a way of taking over where thought leaves off. And technological fundamentalism, in my view, is worse than any form of religious fundamentalism now. We've got to talk about practicing restraint. And I think that we should look forward to the day, I'll be probably good on the harp by that time, but. Uh, <laughs> We should look forward to the day when a president of the United States will say in her inaugural address, see, notice that, <laughs> my fellow Americans, from this day forward, we as a people will measure our progress by how independent of the extractive economy we become. 
We're not going to stop anything all at once, but we're going to start a tendency. And tomorrow morning, my first executive order will be to put a cap on the mines, the wellheads, and the port of entry. And next year, lower that cap and provide incentives for the return to the repopulation of our agricultural countryside. I know you'll join me, my fellow Americans, in this great venture, which is certain to be the most important step, including our walk out of Africa. Good day, my fellow Americans.